So what happens when law enforcement officers conduct a search that is unreasonable? Well, the Fourth Amendment we know guarantees you can't do that. Only reasonable ones, not unreasonable ones. So the exclusionary rule is a judge-made rule. You won't find this language in the text of the Constitution. And it provides that any evidence obtained by the government, where that evidence was obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment guarantee against unreasonable search and seizures, is not admissible in a criminal prosecution to prove guilt. It's not admissible in a criminal prosecution to prove guilt. We're going to exclude evidence that was illegally obtained. That is the rule. So the, so the purpose of the rule, at least on its face, is to deter police misconduct. If we don't allow, we don't admit evidence that was obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment, then that's going to make police misconduct cases go down <laughs> because police don't want to waste their time. If they catch a bad guy, they want to make sure that bad guy gets prosecuted. And so they don't want to overstep the constitutional limits that have been placed on them. Um, that's the assumption. Uh, whether it works or not, I'll leave that up to you to discuss. This is a judge-made rule. Um, so this could be eliminated by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court could say, you know what? No more. Exclusionary rule doesn't apply anymore. Right? If it was from the Constitution, the Supreme Court can't eliminate it, and Congress can't modify it. Now, there could be a constitutional amendment, but besides that, you can't touch it. So the historical development of this is uh, United States. It's an American law. Uh, so this goes back a long way. The first case involving searches and seizures was heard in 1886, and it was applied to all federal prosecutions in 1914, in 1914, Weeks versus Ohio. Uh, so the Silver Platter Doctrine permitted federal courts to admit evidence illegally seized by state law enforcement officers and handed over to federal officers for use in federal cases. So what that means is the federal law enforcement, federal courts couldn't do it. If a federal law enforcement did it, you couldn't use it. But if a state police officer did it, you could hand it to him on a silver platter, and it was admissible, at least for a little while. Um, in fact, there was, a, there was a Supreme Court case in 1949 where the Supreme Court said the exclusionary rule actually doesn't apply to state prosecutions. Now, uh, that changed. Uh, the very first uh, module video you had was about Matt versus Ohio in the How to Brief, Brief a Case video, and that is one of the most important Supreme Court cases for criminal procedure. Map v. Ohio is one of the most important cases law enforcement need to know. Um, it made the exclusionary rule apply to federal and state cases. Now, you may remember this from the case briefing instruction video. I highlighted it. Um, it's a really good one to use as an example because it is um, very important. It is foundational. And most law enforcement officers are state and local. And so this is huge. This applies no matter where you are, no matter what county you're in, whether federal or whether state, it does not matter. The exclusionary rule applies because of the Supreme Court case in 1961, Matt v. Ohio. You can invoke this rule, the exclusionary rule, in pretrial motions, like a motion to dismiss, you can invoke this rule in an appellate brief on appeal, in a post-conviction writ, uh, habeas corpus proceedings. Um, so this, this is not limited to just pretrial motions. Uh, you can invoke this rule um, at various stages of the criminal case. There is a question of who may invoke it, that is, who has standing. So not everyone gets to invoke this rule. If you're, uh, it's a human being, if your Fourth Amendment rights were not violated, you don't have standing to invoke this rule. Only if your Fourth Amendment rights were violated, then you're the one who has standing and you can invoke this rule. The other question is, well, what illegal evidence are we talking about? Well, there's primary and there's secondary, or the fruit of the poisonous tree evidence. So um, illegally seized evidence, we call that the primary evidence. So that could be contraband. 
It could be uh, instruments of crime. Right? It could be evidence like a shirt that's got blood on it. Those kinds of things. But there's also secondary evidence. We call this the fruit of the poisonous tree. The fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine states that once the primary evidence has been shown to be unlawfully obtained, any secondary evidence, that is derivative evidence, is also inadmissible. So when you're encountering that, there is much to be said about the fruit of the poisonous tree secondary evidence that is also inadmissible. And the way this works is, if you um, if you get the primary evidence, you might also get the secondary evidence, and that may be everything that a prosecution has in your case is dismissed. So just uh, one case, um, there was two cases tied one to another. One was a felony case. It was a possession of a controlled substance case against this individual. And the other one was a misdemeanor driving while intoxicated case. There was a motion to suppress. A motion to suppress based on um, a probable cause issue, let's say, and the driving while intoxicated evidence got thrown out, but so did the possession of a controlled substance. Because once this individual was arrested, there was a, a search incident to arrest where the cocaine was found. Um, all of it was thrown out, the misdemeanor and the felony. Uh, so you may say, and I don't mean this uh, to be flippant, but the guy got lucky. Uh, the police officer made a mistake, and so not only did he get out of his DWI misdemeanor case, he also got out of his felony of a controlled substance case. Uh, now, there's probably zero doubt in that officer's mind that this guy was driving while intoxicated, and there's zero doubt in this officer's mind that he was in possession of cocaine because the officer was there. But he didn't have probable cause to stop the vehicle. And since he didn't have probable cause to stop it, he couldn't arrest the guy for DWI legally. And since he couldn't do that, he couldn't search it because the individual did not give consent. Um, and if he would have had probable cause, uh, it is likely this individual would, be, uh, would have been charged and found guilty of DWI and would have been charged and found guilty of possession of a controlled substance. So um, the, the secondary evidence, the fruit of the poisonous tree, is that possession of a controlled substance charge, essentially the cocaine. So keep that in mind. It's not just uh, the initial or the primary evidence. It's also the fruit of the poisonous tree. Because if that tree is poison, so is its fruit. So you know the rule. You will find this to be the case throughout this course. You must know the rule. There are multiple rules you must know, but then you must know the exceptions to the rules. So let's run through these very quickly. There is, first of all, the good faith exception. Uh, the evidence obtained by police is admissible in court, even if there was an error or mistake, as long as the error or mistake was not committed by the police. Let's assume that a court made a mistake. Well, the exclusionary rule isn't there to protect accidental mistakes by the court. It's there to prevent police misconduct. So if the police are acting in good faith, the exclusionary rule, at least allegedly, has nothing to do with it. Um, so the good faith exception is an exception to the exclusionary rule. There's also the inevitable discovery exception. So even if the police officers uh, violate the Fourth Amendment, and obtain information that leads to evidence, which would, let's say, easily prove and convict someone, uh, it would be admissible if the police can prove that they would have inevitably found it or discovered it by a lawful means, regardless of the illegal action. So if um, someone is, uh, gives a uh, Let's say testimony about something, uh, they say, yes, this is it, but let's assume that confession was uh, illegally obtained. But there's another officer who is walking the yard and literally trips upon the dead body. Well, we law enforcement officers didn't really need that confession because this guy was about to trip over it. They're searching for a body, and they found it by tripping over it. Well, that one's likely going to be admissible because you tripped over it. Uh, so inevitable discovery exception. That's probably not the best um, 
uh, sort of case for this, but it's inevitable. It's going to happen anyway. It was going to happen, Your Honor. Um, we don't we don't need this illegally obtained confession because we had all this other evidence and we were going to find it in the next five minutes anyway. It was inevitable. Therefore, there's an exception. Here is the purged taint exception. The purged taint exception. That's when an act of free will by the defendant, an act of free will by the defendant, uh, breaks this causal chain, sort of linking the illegal police conduct to the evidence. If that uh, defendant's free will act sort of breaks in and breaks that chain, and the police can say, oh, well, now we have it this way, that purged taint uh, exception will apply. Uh, so this exception is the independent source exception. So let's assume we have uh, two co-conspirators in a bank robbery. And the first uh, suspect has a group of police officers interrogating him, and the second suspect has a group of police officers interrogating him. In the first case, the police officers do it all wrong. They violate the suspect's rights. But there's a confession, and he says, this is where it is. You can go find the money here and the guns we used and the mask. It all has our fingerprints on it. It's at this particular location. At the exact same time, the other co-conspirator is also being interrogated by police officers. But those police officers do not violate his rights. They do everything by the book. They tell him he doesn't have to talk to them. He has a right to remain silent. He has a right to an attorney. Um, they tell him everything they're supposed to. But he also tells them precisely where the goods are. Here's the money, here's the guns, here's the masks at this location. So we have two sets of officers and they both arrive on the scene of the hidden bank robbery money uh, because that was an independent source that, that led law enforcement to the place where the money was hidden in the guns and the masks. Um, that independent source exception is going to come in and the defendants will not be allowed to, or the ones who, I'm sorry, the one who had his rights violated will not be allowed to invoke the exclusionary rule with success. Even though the other person didn't have his rights violated, therefore the exclusionary rule wouldn't apply. The one whose rights were violated, uh, he can invoke it all day long. It's just not going to be meritorious because there was an independent source, therefore the exception. So there's also instances where, um, look, the rule doesn't even apply in the first place. So violations of the knock and announce rule, private searches, that is searches by private individuals, not government agents, uh, grand jury investigations. The grand jury can look into things that otherwise wouldn't be admissible. Uh, at sentencing, some uh, courts are allowed to look at this after the conviction. So you can't use it to convict the person, but after the person is convicted, typically this you know fruit of the poisonous tree is rather good evidence, and so it can be used by some courts uh, to sentence, to take into consideration while sentencing. Um, arrest based on probable cause that violates state law. Violation of agency rules, non-criminal proceedings, and parole revocation hearings. Uh, so civil cases, uh, administrative issues uh, that you might have uh, with uh, a, a federal agency uh, and then parole revocation hearings. Parole revocation hearings uh, are not uh, conviction, right? Someone has already been convicted of a crime. They've been given community supervision or parole and the state says, hey, this person violated the terms of community supervision or parole and we'd like to revoke it and send them back to jail. Well, it's not a new crime per se. And so uh, they can use this tainted evidence for those cases. So these are not exceptions. These are instances where the rule simply does not apply. So I mentioned at the beginning, does everyone think this is the best rule in the world? Um, well, it's supposed to deter violations of constitutional rights by police and prosecution, right? Prosecutors and law enforcement officers are not supposed to violate defendants' rights. And if they do, this, is, this rule is supposed to deter them from that because they will lose their case if there is no evidence. There's also arguments against the rules. Opponents, and this is including Supreme Court justices, they have opposed it. It's wrong to make society pay and victims pay because a police officer's mistake. And so just be, just because they made a mistake doesn't mean that the victim's rights, I mean, they don't have any. 
Uh, the prosecution is going to lose its entire case because a police officer did this or did that. Um, so I, um, you can, you can, you can weigh these um, arguments. You can read more about them. I tend to think that the exclusionary rule is uh, important. Um, if I were a justice and I was making an opinion, I would be in favor of the exclusionary rule and uh, would not want to get rid of it. Um, I think there are so many exceptions already and instances where it simply does not apply that it's much diminished. Um, but I think that there is uh, there, there are good reasons for keeping it. I also find some of the arguments on the other side to be compelling. Uh, the, the idea that sometimes we even um, not force, but we incentivize police officers into perjuring themselves because all they have to say is yes, I saw the car cross the center lane for three seconds and then cross back. Therefore, I had probable cause. Well, what if that didn't happen? They just lied on the stand because this is a really, really, really bad guy. And so there are issues of, of ethics that come up. And so the exclusionary rule might incentivize some people to lie, although that's another crime and they shouldn't be doing that in the first place. All right, there are some alternatives. One is, hey, look, we're going to admit the evidence. It's really good anyway for the most part. And then let's deal with the wrongdoing later. Let's put the cops on the stand in a separate trial or let's allow for... Uh, so you have to make your mind up about whether you think it is a good rule or a bad rule or somewhere in between. Uh, but you certainly need to know it because it is now law and it is applicable to all law enforcement officers and prosecutors and defendants who have had their rights violated can invoke it. Um, now, there has been a little bit over time, you've seen exceptions, you've seen instances where the rule simply does not apply, that the um, efficacy of the rule might have been slightly diminished. So I'm not entirely sure it's as robust as it sounds at its onset, uh, but something for you to think about. Um, you can think about sort of from policy point of view and ethics point of view, um, what's the better course of, uh, of action if there are two of them, or if there are more than two courses of action, what's the best one? Thank you.